Well, let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you all to the Future Trends Forum. I'm glad to see you all here today. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator. I'm the host and the chief cat herder. And today we're really going to dive into a fantastic subject with the help of a terrific person. But before we do that, let me introduce the forum. Let me explain what its goal is, how it works, who sponsors it, and then we'll join this week's guest. Uh, to begin with, uh, let me just tell you that we have been doing the forum for, well, more than four years. We are, in fact, in our fifth year, which is very, very exciting. Uh, the forum, if you're new to it, is a conversation-based venue. What I'm doing right now is showing you a slide I'm only going to do for a minute. <clears throat> the goal instead is to have conversation. So we don't have presentations. We don't have PowerPoint. We're not a webinar. Uh, this is all about discussion back and forth between well, a whole bunch of you as well as a splendid guest. Uh, that's the goal of this. And so far, this seems to be unique. Now, the forum is also part of a broader research project called the Future of Education Observatory. Now, this is an ongoing participatory, open and multimedia, multimodal effort to try to grapple with the future of higher education. So, so far, that includes this forum, which happens every week. It includes the FTTE report, which looks at major trends reshaping higher education, and that comes out every month. It also includes a blog, it includes a bookstore, and even a book club. So if you'd like to learn more about this, just go to futureofeducation.us and you can learn more. Now, we can only do this work with the help of some very generous supporters, and I'd like to thank them uh, before we go further. I'd like to start by thanking NYSERNEP from New York State. Uh, that's a nonprofit that helps that state's colleges and universities do great stuff together. Uh, they support them in getting online with broadband networks, and they also facilitate professional development and research. Uh, they do great work, and we're grateful to them for their support. We're also grateful to Shindig, because as you can see, Shindig makes available the technology we're using right now. So let me just walk you through it if you're new to it or if you haven't been here before. First of all, where I am right now and where this slide is just for a minute is called the stage. And we call it that because everyone involved in this conversation can see and hear everything that goes on on stage. This is where our guest will be in just a minute. And this is where you can be. And I'll show you how to do that. Now, right below us, you'll see between eight and 20 different people. Um, these are represented either by a live video feed, like you can see uh, Jessica Surden, uh, or by a picture, uh, like Tanya Means. Um, sometimes there's more than one person uh, at a given login. But the key thing is, that's what some people call the audience, and what I think of as the participants more. Um, if you want to talk to anybody there, and there are a couple of ways, but one is just double click on their icon. And if they want to talk to you and their camera is working, your two icons will click together like Legos and you can have your own private audiovisual conversation, which is pretty neat. Now, I mentioned this is all about discussion. How can we have this kind of discussion? Well, there are two major tools. Look down at the bottom of the screen. You should have a few different buttons. One of them uh, is a button for well, that looks like a question mark. And one of them is a raised hand. If you click the raised hand button, that tells me that you're ready to join us up here on stage. So all you have to do is uh, press that, and as long as your mic and camera are working, you can join us right up here. Now, if you can't do that, if your microphone and camera aren't working or you're not in a place where you can ask uh, questions out loud, that's fantastic, no problem. Just use the question mark button. That lets you type in a question. And, or a comment, and when the time is right, I'll flash it on the screen so everyone can see it, and I'll read it out loud so everyone can hear it. So during the next hour, as you have thoughts, as you have reflections, as you have pushback, as you have examples, as you have celebrations, it just inquiries, just use either of those buttons to share your thoughts, and I'll bring them up. If it sounds complicated, it's really easy. It takes about one button press for me, um, and it'll flow very, very easily. Now, if you're also on Twitter right now, just use the hashtag FTTE. In fact, we can see some people who have been tweeting away already, and uh, we'll bring those in uh, as we go. So join us with a, a raised hand or a question mark, and we'd be delighted to hear your thoughts. And we're delighted to Shindig. We're delighted about Shindig sharing this technology with us.
We're also grateful to our supporters on Patreon. Uh, these are fine folks who contribute as little as a dollar a month to make sure they keep all the lights on and the machines running happily. In fact, the people on this slide contribute $10 or more a month. Great folks like Erwin DeVries, Robin DeRosa, Chris Lott, Mike Ricicci, Joanna Richardson, Seth Goodman, Michael Slay, Jenny Swenson, Karen Cagliosi. I mean, fantastic people. And we're really grateful to them for their support. And you can join them. Just go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander and you can learn more. So that's how we do the forum. That's the technology behind it. That's how we, how we pay for it. Um, that's our intention. Now what I'd like to do is welcome this week's guest. I'm absolutely delighted to have uh, Mary Churchill here. Uh, she is a dean at the University of Boston. She's also the creator of the University of Venus, which is a fantastic ongoing effort to explore and celebrate the role of women in education. The theme here, I think, is for us to think about the role of women in higher education, how women, what challenges women face, and how what women create a new academia all around this, and how we can best help them. Mary, welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I'm so glad you could make it. Um, I have I have so many questions to ask you, um, and I need to get out of the way and let everybody else ask the questions. But let me begin. Okay. Two really really easy questions. First, what are you going to be working on for the rest of 2020? What's what's uppermost in your mind? What's going to be taking up the most hours as it, as you go forward? <laughs> In my life, ah, so I just—I think you know this. We—I just submitted a manuscript to Johns Hopkins for um, a book. It's called *The Good Closure*, and that was around the Wheelock College Boston University merger, which I was the uh, chief academic officer at Wheelock um, and helped lead that merger. And now I am associate dean at Boston University Wheelock College, uh, leading the building of this new college. So. Um, finalizing that, getting that ready for spring 2021 publication uh, will take up probably the rest of this year, but also new project that I'm working on, which is the lack of gender diversity in higher ed boards mm. um, and senior leadership teams at universities in the United States. So that's a brand new project. It just presented on that for the first time last weekend. So. <clears throat> Well, wow, so you have two research projects, and meanwhile, you're helping lead a new academic entity into existence. Yes, those would be the top priorities. Right, God, I don't think you're allowed anymore. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, uh, and podcasts and blog posts, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, speaking of, of blog posts, that was the second question you asked. So for people who don't know this, what is the University of Venus? So the University of Venus is something that I started with a small group of women, about 10 of us, in 2010. Mm -hmm. So we had a brainstorming session. We thought, you know, we don't feel comfortable at our current institutions kind of asking, I guess, risky or challenging questions. And so mm -hmm. we were looking for a community um, where we could feel like we could field some questions and get some answers. We, we were coming up with challenging issues of the future of higher ed. Um, and so blogging was big then, right? And this is 2010. So we started a blog with an editorial collective of 10 women. And it was one of those DIY WordPress jobs where we were just blogging away. And then we were approached right away by Inside Higher Ed. Uh, so I think we started in January, and by June, we were at Inside Higher Ed. Wow. So um, that was exciting. It was when Inside Higher Ed started Blog U, so it was right in the beginning of all of that. And uh, then the Chronicle approached us and asked us to move from Inside Higher Ed to the Chronicle, and we said no. <laughs> we said, no, we don't agree with your paywall model, so we did not do it, and we stuck with IHE, and they've been wonderful. And so we're on year 11. And... We've had writers from over 30 countries. We've had guest contributors. I think over 100 women and some men have blogged with us around Whoa. a myriad of issues. So, I'm sorry, can you say that number again? Was it over 100? Contributors, yes. Wow. Wow. It's, we're in year 11. <laughs> oh, no, but you know, you've got you've got themes like uh, 
like Josh Kim, who's just, you know, go a one person band, right? Yeah. Yes. And you're talking about a mighty collective. That's a lot of folks. It's a, some pretty intense community building. And that was, I think, our priority from the beginning was not necessarily to get um, one person's voice out there, you know, or kind of my voice out there. But how do we create a platform that we can amplify a bunch of women and, and some men around issues, right? Some kind of issues that are near and dear to their heart and really try to do that across the globe, which I think was, we were originally one of the international blogs at Inside Higher Ed when they had an international group. So they brought us on the Worldview and Global Higher Ed, Chris Old's uh, blog at the same time. So uh, we were built in the international space, which was great. And and it's it's still wonderful. Well, and I, I just you know wholeheartedly recommend it. This is one of my regular reads, and I'm always always uh, excited to uh, learn and to uh, and see what comes up from this. Um, well, I, I promised two two easy uh, questions. I had no idea that they would reveal such vast enterprises. Um, that's really really awesome. Uh, let me just uh, quickly welcome a few folks that have just come on in, uh, like Kenan and uh, Regina, uh, Jasmine, Danon, Chris. Roxanne, Charles, Roberta, Robin, Rebecca, Angela, and Doyle. Uh, people have just been flocking in as, as we've been talking. Uh, the forum is, is all about conversation, and I, I, I want to hear from folks. Um, so let me just remind everybody that uh, the, uh, the video option and the text option both stand open. And if you'd like to chat with each other, just use the text chat. But uh, I really want to hear from you on these two different through those two different buttons. Uh, I've got a, a ton of questions, but let me just start off with one that's a maybe an unusual question. Uh, for the past uh, 300 years, higher education in the U.S. Uh, has mostly been a men's institution. Most of the faculty have been men. Most of the administration has been men. Most of the students have been men. Um, but starting at a certain point recently, uh, the majority of students have been uh, women, uh, both undergrad and grad schools and across the United States. And yeah. that number just continues to widen, uh, which is just remarkable. And and I don't think it, it receives the attention it's due. So a, a question I'd like to ask you is, how does how does that particular fact change uh, higher education, that the normative student is now a woman rather than a man? How has that changed academia, do you think? Well, I think one thing that I've noticed right away is that there is more pressure on diversifying uh, the teaching workforce and the administration, right? I think as we diversify our student body um, with gender and race diversity, we, the students do put pressure on um, the universities to diversify the leadership, but also the faculty. Right, so they they want a faculty that represents them and looks like them, okay. and um, when they don't have that, they speak out. So that that's just an immediate piece that I've noticed um, that okay. isn't just around uh, gender, but also around race. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great question. I you know do does teaching style change? Um, I mean, I would think about that piece too. Um, do we? have to teach differently to for different types of students and different audiences? And I guess that's one question to ask. Yeah. Different gendered styles of communication within the classroom, either online or face-to-face. -face. Well, that's uh, something that uh, I've, I've been, I mean, in my own experience, I've been, I've been seeing. I, I don't know if I told you the story. When the uh, first time I taught a writing seminar in the 1990s, I uh, had my students write short papers and workshop them with each other, pretty couple of pedagogy. And um, one young woman wrote uh, an essay about um, different styles of speech, uh, mm. gender. And um, in the workshop discussion, uh, one of the students, a male, said, um, I don't think that's true. Uh, I don't think that really applies at all. And she started to say, well, if you look at the and he interrupted her. <laughs> and and then and she started to respond and he interrupted her again. And and it was uh, the whole class turned on him. Do you realize what you're doing? Yeah. Um, and he didn't, not, not until the end. Um, but do you do you think maybe we'll see a greater emphasis in uh, perhaps uh, discussion oriented um, uh, pedagogies, more interest in uh, project based learning, or perhaps we'll see uh, a decline in the kind of 
fiercely competitive structure that we have in higher education, everything from grades to titles. You know, so I, we, we just had a podcast conversation. Our podcast goes live this afternoon with uh, Sherry. I'm going to kill her last name because it's, it's Spielich, edified listener on Twitter. And we, the whole conversation was around the importance of listening. And in that conversation, I said, you know, I think 20th century skills were all about speaking and presenting and knowing your stuff and kind of having that confidence and teaching our students to have that confidence to perform in front of the classroom and present. Mm -hmm. And I feel this real turn towards teaching our students to listen mm -hmm. and to be better listeners and to, to really engage and listen and involve um, involved with reflective behavior where you know you can actually listen to someone and repeat back what they've just said to you because you've actually really listened to them, not just waited for them to finish. So um, I do think there's this turn. And I don't know if it is tied to gender or um, yeah. issues we're facing in the world right now. Well, that's, I, I hope so. Um, <laughs> that would be a, a fantastic turn. Um, Friends, um, please consider yourselves unleashed to ask um, to ask questions, everything from uh, pedagogy and enrollment to professional development. Um, uh, should I should I call you Doctor Churchill, or do you prefer your 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 dean title? Mary's fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can call me it as long as it's yeah, but yeah, Mary's fine. I I consider myself calling you Brian, so you can call me Mary. I'm happy to be called that. I get called okay. all okay. um, If you um, but you mentioned your your newer research project um, about uh, representation of women on boards and in senior administration. So if any of you would like to ask questions about that, um, please feel free. As you can tell, um, Mary is uh, very kind and. Uh, Clearly, obviously, a great listener, uh, and we'll take your questions very, very seriously. Um, so while people are scrambling to, uh, to ask their own questions, um, let me ask a, a different question, um, which is, how can all of higher education, male, female, non-binary, all together, best support women in, as scholars and as administrators right now? I think a lot of the work I've seen, um, many people, not just women, um, but but women disproportionately struggle with is around caretaking. Um, so uh, women are often, uh, particularly women of a certain age in the sandwich generation, um, but men are in this situation too, of taking care of children and taking care of elders. And so I think there are these responsibilities outside of work that, that are really um, putting a lot of pressure on, on people who are care taking that caretaking role. And then um, they end up doing that type of work in the workplace too. So they end up being the people, and this is true for folks of color, women of color, uh, students of color will go to them, um, where they're doing a lot of that caretaking at in the universities, right? They have uh, service obligations that are sometimes official and sometimes unofficial where their advisees will be extensive and will sometimes have more challenging issues that require more time and emotional labor. So I think that piece, and that's not, that that can be men or women, but it's the studies show that disproportionately it falls on women in the departments. Yeah. I think that's an important, that's, that's tough work. I think teaching's tough. I mean, teaching yeah. is emotional work and we don't talk about it enough. Mm -hmm. um, but for those of us, which is the majority who really care about our students, mm -hmm. it's emotional labor. And I think that when we tie it too much to workforce development and just skill development, we take all of the human piece out of it. So um, mm. it's just my plug for emotional labor of teaching. Sure, sure. Um, no, I, I, I completely agree. And again, those of you um, in the uh, participant swarm who are either instructors right now or who are closely with instructors, uh, this is a great time for you to put forth a question about that, about the uh, role that emotional labor plays in instruction, but also how institutions can best support uh, people conducting such work. Um, well, let, let me, you know, let me turn the question around for, to another side. Um, if I were to ask what are the biggest challenges facing women in higher education, especially uh, thinking about faculty and administrators as well as students, 
I mean, the short answer is to say sexism, patriarchy, misogyny. But I'm wondering, in your work at the University of Venus, what are some of the biggest challenges under that header that have that, that, that loom largest? And you mentioned uh, women playing a disproportionate role in emotional labor and caretaking. Uh, what are some of the other challenges that we should be aware of? I, pay pay inequity. <laughs> <laughs> right. So there is pay inequity within similar um, um, same rank, same title, same department. But then there's also the predominant uh, the feminization of casual labor within academia. Right. So the lower you are on the pay scale within academia, whether that's uh, uh, faculty or staff and administration, you have more women. Right. And the, and the higher up you get, if you're a full professor, um, you're less likely to be a woman. You're more likely to be a man. If you're, uh, you know, the college president or the president's cabinet or on the board, you're more likely to be a man. So there is that inequity structurally and even within um, same positions, there's a pay inequity. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it is um, men negotiate harder um, and continue to negotiate. Uh, I see that where um, men will get an offer, you know, even when they're in their position, you know, they're an associate professor, they'll get an offer from another institution and come back and um, yeah. will negotiate a higher salary for them. They're much more likely to do that than women. So how do we, by we, I mean academia and academia adjacent. Um, how do we solve that? <laughs> how do we address that? I mean, it, well, I think there is uh, training. Uh, I think, you know, being at a state institution versus being at a private institution at the publics, all the salaries are public. So that helps. That that brings a certain uh, check on the behavior of the behind the scenes negotiation. Unions help with that, right? Unions prevent you from giving a pay raise behind the scenes. Um, you also lose people because you can't give them a retention um, boost. But uh, so there are some measures that bring in some equity. Well, that's. Um... And then training, you know, training people who hire and who are able to negotiate higher salaries for folks. Well, that's you just laid out a comprehensive program. Thank you. I mean, we're, <laughs> we're done here. I mean, this is. <laughs> I just solved all the problems, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I can I can I can tell from the from both the clarity of your expression as well as how much is packed into it. I can see both uh, the voice of someone who has been writing regularly for a general audience and explaining things very clearly uh, in a short form um, in, in inside higher ed, as well as an academic administrator who has to speak right. for diverse audiences and mobilize them. Um, so and I've been in administration since she's ninety four, maybe. So, yes. So, um, so yes. <laughs> wow, I hadn't real. Oh, I just, I had not realized that. I had not realized that. So that, yes, I, I'm used to talking about these types of issues. I think we've come a long way. I, you know, it, it is amazing. We, we are diversifying um, racially, uh, gender, um, sexuality. People being more open and feeling more comfortable being open about their sexual preference. Um, mm -hmm. It is. It, it is a vastly different world but it is as everything within higher ed it's slow for some of us it feels painfully slow and it's incremental and for some of us we can see how much further we have to go right and so yeah. that's it's, it's keeping your optimism at the same time you're trying to make change happen i saw a good stat on a semi-related story which was uh, looking at how campuses responded to the coronavirus in february and in the first half of February, campuses were slow to respond to the outbreak in China. Um, you know, in terms of, of, of uh, you know, testing students or study abroad. Yeah. And so on. yeah. But in the second half um, of February, once the outbreak branched out to South Korea, Italy, and Iran, then campuses responded much more quickly. Um, and it, it it wasn't so much the change in nation. In fact, the nations that it spread to were less significant in many ways for the U.S. Um, but I think a growing awareness of the problem. And so the response curve went up. And I wonder if we uh, might not be seeing that um, in higher education. 
I, you know, that's interesting. And just for a moment uh, to speak to that issue, it'd be interesting to see if the institutions that have a higher percentage of Chinese students um, were more on the ball faster because they were seeing the economic impact of this. Well, I've been, I've been trying to track that. And uh, I found some of that in Southeast Asia, uh, Australian and uh, New Zealand uh, institutions, which have often have a lot of Chinese students, um, were very, very quick to lobby their government and, and so on. Yeah. I haven't been able to differentiate that within the U.S. Though it's a it's a great question. Um, friends, you're, you're being too kind and letting me have the floor, and this, and and you should stop. Ask some questions. <laughs> we hear your thoughts. We need to hear your questions. So again, please just either press the uh, uh, the raised hand button if you want to join us up here on stage, which is easy as can be. If you'd like, you can imagine the Star Trek transporter sound as that happens, um, or you can just press the uh, question mark button and quickly type in a question. Um, we haven't had any questions from Twitter. We've mostly just had signs of appreciation. Um, uh, Dr. Rebecca Pope Ruark, excuse me, I'm going to mangle her last name, said that uh, Mary Churchill was talking about teaching as emotional labor and emotional work. Agreed. There is a vulnerability when we enter into the classroom, especially if one has no pedagogical training. Problems in research are good, problems in teaching are taboo. Um, so that wasn't a question, but it was very good comment. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I have, like, like I said, I had I had tons of questions, and I, I want to uh, approach the University of Venus from uh, another angle, perhaps from Mercury, uh, which is to ask, what do you think of the connection between the rising number and status of women in academia and technology? Um, is is this an area where? Um, you know, everything from IT departments, you know, how can we grow more women in IT departments to uh, how can we best support women through technology? Hmm. It's not something, I, you know, I mean, I think of um, the online environment that we've been able to grow in, in University of Venus, right? So I think that the community we've developed there has been completely enabled through technology um, and the Zoom conversations we have for our podcast. I was just, it's, we could not have built a global community of a hundred contributors without technology, right? And I think, so for that, I, I mean, that part seems easy. Um, I do think that it's, it is one of those areas that's been hard to diversify. Um, racially and with gender, um, sciences in general. I was part of an advanced grant at uh, Northeastern University, mm -hmm. you know, kind of diversifying, um, getting more women in the STEM fields as an NSF advanced multi-million dollar, multi-year uh, tr institutional transformation grant. And uh, there, there's some great resources through advance, the different iterations of the advance grants. But it's um, what's interesting around STEM is that a lot of the work happens in teams, as you know, and so you have, it's, it's very collaborative and you'll have the articles are, you know, have 30 to 45 authors. Sure, sure. Um, but it's a really challenging space for women to break into. And so women are underrepresented in those areas. Um, but all the studies show us that women are better at collaborative work. So it's kind of this, um, mm. you know, you would think that it would be a space where women would excel. Yeah. Um, so the gatekeeping and the barriers are what we start to look at, what, what's in the way of that. So um, maybe technology, which, you know, technology has done a, a lot of collaborative work in technology too, but it's an area where a lot of women are kept out. So. It's so interesting because we, in many ways, you know, the culture around technology is vast, but there's this perception that 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 technology is uh, isolating or um, solitary. Um, you know, we often, even when we speak about it, we'll talk about um, uh, a screen or a piece of hardware rather than us using that to communicate with somebody else. Yeah. But in reality, we love technology yeah. firstly. We, we always have. Um, let me circle back just the thing you said, which which was just blew me away. And I, I want if you could unpack it a little bit, and then we've got a couple of questions. That just okay. Came. When you mentioned the University of Venus and growing that community, uh, if you could say a bit more about how you did that through the uh, primarily text part of of columns, and then if you could say a bit more about how you did that with uh, video and audio. So I think part of 
part of the reason that University of Venus grew so quickly and uh, was so successful is that we were in the higher ed space, but we were incredibly inclusive. Yeah. Um, and you could argue that not focusing on men, it, you, you know, you could go down that path. But we've always said, and and men are welcome. We prioritize women, but men are welcome. So, um, but we did lots of calls for guest bloggers, and that's common now. It wasn't common then. So this was, you know, eleven years ago. We were like, we're looking for contributors. We are looking for guest bloggers. Uh, you can even submit a post in another language. It doesn't have to be English and we'll translate it into English for you. So um, the mastermind behind you, Venus, uh, the, the person I created this with, Meg Palladino, um, runs the English language, runs summer programs and English language programs at Yale. And oh. we were working together at Northeastern doing that. And so we had this orientation towards kind of a preference for global contributors and people whose uh, first language was not English. And so that approach of being very inclusive and trying to create a space where everyone felt welcome and that they belonged and that they had a contribution to make was part of the ethos of the construction of that space. Um, and so we had, I mean, we had, we've had people from all over the world and we're, we will do some handholding. You know, we ask for a 750 word contribution, but we'll get academics in Europe who will, Submit something that has three thousand words. <laughs> Just at the drop of the hat. Yeah. Right. So we'll do the work of okay. This is how you bring it down to seven hundred and fifty, and here's how maybe you you know we want to keep your voice there, but we also want to make it readable. And so we've done that back and forth work of really um, helping people uh, find the space as a community. So. Wow. Great. Well, thank you. That's 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 important. And now the podcasts are through Zoom, so we're recording through Zoom. So we're not just doing. You you've been on a podcast through Rocking the Academy, so you know that even on that one. Uh, so we're trying to build this community face to face on this virtual environment. Um, even though we're just using audio, there is something about uh, being able to see the folks that you're talking to that makes it richer. So I agree yeah. right here. Exactly. <laughs> to me, about the production process is that you use Zoom and you use video for the for the conversation, but then the output, uh, the video is gone. The output is audio only. Yes. That's, that's very clever. That's very very clever. Um, we have a whole bunch of questions that just came in. Just oh good. Pop the cork and let me just put a couple of these up on um, the screen for you to see. Okay. Uh, and these are not in any particular order except the way they came in. So uh, we've got. Um, from Angela Yu at Georgia Tech, who asks, what strategies have you found to be effective in addressing implicit bias in academia? I feel uh, Brian actually was just exhibited or uh, illustrated a, an example from his class. I think calling attention, not in a negative way, but if you can call attention to uh, bias, implicit bias or microaggression on the spot, um, and you're in a group environment the way Brian did within his class, I think that is very effective because all you actually really introduce is a pause and asking people to look a little closer at what's going on. Yeah. And most people in the room will have an aha moment and realize what has just happened. So that, that I have actually found that to be one of the most effective ways because you're using the dynamics of the group rather than just a single person kind of calling it out. Um, but sometimes you have to be stronger than that, right? Sometimes people don't see it. Um, and sometimes you have to protect the person who is um, the recipient of the bias. And so that is that takes a different method. That's one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks where you kind of, you know, tell them what happened and, sh and show them, you know, kind of what happened. Um, really engaging if you have a leadership group that you can engage around this, if that's a group of chairs or a group of program directors, if you're, you're dealing with faculty. Um, so using your leaders, official and unofficial leaders, to help you um, change culture. Um, so, yeah, so, but it's a sensitive issue. If you can pull it, if you can draw it out in a public or a group setting, it can be very effective and you can change culture very quickly because you actually can realize that most of the people in the room have noticed it and and you just create the space where they can feel comfortable saying that they noticed it so 
Well, thank you. That's a great answer. And Angela, thank you so much for the terrific yeah. question. Thank you. If you're new to the forum, that's an example of a text question. Now I'd like to show you an example of a video question. Ah. Uh, this is uh, Barbara Hall from North Central University, uh, a director of curriculum and associate professor of something, Barbara, but it got cut off. Hi, Are Barbara. You? Hello. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, so my question relates to a phenomenon I see not necessarily at my university. Um, I live near other universities, major R1 universities. And sometimes I see this phenomenon where um, women engage in almost bullying-like behaviors, tearing apart other women in order to sort of reiterate their perception of superiority or, or look what, what I've been able to do when you have to go through the ringer like I did. Yeah. And I'm wondering, similar to what you mentioned about culture, how can we change that culture when it occurs? Why do you think that is? Is it just that some of the women who've had success have had to demonstrate those behaviors because they've had to learn those? Yeah. How do, how do we address that in the future of higher ed for women are working apart instead of together? That I think is one of the most challenging situations, right? And it's heartbreaking. Right? <laughs> you're like, wait a minute, you're supposed to be on my side. Um, I think I th sometimes I think there are some generational differences. So part of the reason we started University of Venus with this Gen X focus, um, because we were dealing with a lot of that from uh, uh, baby boomers and older women who had you know fought so hard to get into such few positions. And so um, the behavior you described is something that we, uh, many of us had encountered really. Um, and so, that that is challenging. Uh, you know, I I think that in general, academia is. Uh, Chris Newfield just described this to me very effectively, and I thought I thought it was something that I had just imagined. Um, the general culture is this passive aggressive um, middle class white culture, which is does not value direct communication. Right. So I think that there is a challenge of women not always being effective direct communicators, right? So I find myself um, trying to read between the lines, like what, what did they not say or what did they say or what did that really mean? And so, cause I'm a very blunt direct communicator. So I, I will get into trouble sometimes where I, I'm not reading between the lines effectively. But um, I think the, the best thing for me that I have found in those types of situations um, some of those situations I've addressed directly uh, when I thought that I, that could be effective. And sometimes that work has worked and sometimes it has backfired on me. Um, but I also think that, and that's if that person's in a leadership position above you, right? That's, that's a really challenging position. But um, again, I think engaging leaders within a unit, so engaging chairs or engaging program directors and, and trying to problem solve with a group is I found very effective at um, getting behavior to change, getting people's behavior to change. Sometimes they don't even realize what they're doing or that their behavior is having the impact it has. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. It's a, that's the toughest question that has been asked. <laughs> Brian's questions were so easy. That's a tough, tough question. What do you do when the women are disappointing you because they're acting in a way that really, uh, yeah. you know, marginalizes you, right? So. Well, thank you, Barbara. That was a great question. And uh, Mary, that was a small dissertation of an answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, that was really, really rich. We have more questions are just piling in. So okay. let me bring, this is one from um, uh, Keenan Solanero, who asks, what about changes in the system itself? First, training women in negotiation risks a label of aggressive. And two, the system itself could potentially change such that negotiation itself is more partnered. Ooh, that's interesting. Partnered negotiation. I don't, can you explain further or do we, can you? Um, Kenan, if, you, if you'd if you like to follow up either, uh, just, just click the raised hand if you're up for video or just type in another question uh, text and, and I can flash that on the screen as well, whichever you like. Uh, in fact, uh, Kenan, just uh, let me bring Ken up on stage. Okay, um, that's fascinating. Partnered, I love it. Hello, and is it Kenan? So, okay. All right. So you're hearing me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
I had to change computers. I, I had lost the connection before, so here I am. So I missed some of the presentation. I look forward to going back and seeing the recorded. But I, too, have been um, in STEM. I, I'm a woman in science. And in fact, one of the first faculty in chemistry at Georgetown that was female. I was female number two. And what I'm asking about on that partnering is, you know, there's this whole movement in my generation for what I used to call taking a man's suit and making it into a skirt, right? To masculinize the female. Yeah. And negotiation is such a practice. And it doesn't fit well for women, just like a business suit that suddenly has a skirt on it isn't really the best look, right? Mm -hmm. So in the negotiation, should we perhaps question that whole premise that one fights for oneself and that this is the sort of, um, uh, you know, the, the gladiator version of how one makes oneself up the ranks in academia, because it doesn't fit well for women. It's not a, a, as a general thing. And I even hearing that m myself saying that I'm thinking, well, maybe I could rephrase that. But might we question the system rather than try to train up women? Yeah, no. And I think uh, studies have shown that it's it doesn't work well for people of color either. Um, it really works well for white men. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. so, um, but what the partnering piece, what do you mean by partnering in a negotiation? Well, uh, what I mean is that the, um, the entity that is expecting to be negotiated with by a white male, but not necessarily with the other groups, that they, they partner rather than be the negotiation um, uh, um, judge, judger, you know, the judge of the negotiation process. So ah, they themselves lower themselves yeah. Yeah. in how the process works and say, okay, we're here on the same page. We're trying to create a great um, academic environment. You are a candidate. Um, how can we partner together so that we have our needs met, you have your needs met, no matter what, how, how you're showing up, no matter what you're packaged in. Yes. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I have done some of that organically myself um, with staff members when I've made offers to them and they've taken the offer that I've given them. I have told them, no, <laughs> never, ever take the first offer. Right. So I've kind of walked them through here is, you know, against my better interest. Right. If I'm managing my budget, I'm not supposed to do that. But I do it because I think it's the right thing to do. Um and so I have taught them how to negotiate on the spot and and given folks more because I think it's, it's right to do that. But um, even that's, I, I'm gonna interject here just quickly because I have a good friend at Stanford who recently went through that. And even that seems like an early step in that direction because her experience of it was the person said, yes, you should negotiate, but then also cut down anything that she came forward with. It was a very awkward kind of first step to be yeah. coached and how you should, there's something better we could be doing there. Yes, yes, yes. Cool. And I've seen, um, I've seen hiring managers change behavior in this area, right? Where they go back to, in my situation, they'll go back to a provost and, and ask for, basically negotiate on behalf of the candidate. Um, because they feel that the candidate did not um, negotiate enough for themselves. So they'll get kind of permission to go back and offer more um, as if the candidate had asked for more. So, uh, well, which well, never happened in the past. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that, but it's an, it's an equity uh, minded approach, right? Because they're, they yeah. have realized I've just hired this man who negotiated for X and I'm about to hire this woman who did not negotiate this this is wrong so they're trying to build those steps in great and how do i get back down off the stage here <laughs> no, I, I push you right off it's i think brian just kicked you off. thank you brian <laughs> thank you so thank much you. yes great My pleasure great question um you see friends this is uh this gets to work really really smoothly uh and we have more questions that are coming in i don't need to exhort you you're just doing it on your own which is perfect uh we have a question from carrie pinnell uh, who asks how do we make visible the work of boards and how important is it to diversify boards oh carrie that's the best question ever <laughs> <laughs> that is my mission in life <laughs> So, uh, boards are very, very hidden. Um, and boards, as we know, run our universities, right? I mean, uh, this is, I think, when people ask me about making moves from one institution to another, I tell them to study the board. 
and look at who is on that board and because that board will choose your next president and they will choose the direction of your institution in the next 10 years. I, and I think that boards are not visible at all. And so I think that individually, we all need to start asking more about the boards um, mm. and, and making ourselves aware of who is on the board of our institution. Um, and when I talk about diversity on boards, there's gender diversity, there's race diversity, but it's also what do these people do for a living, right? Now, if they're all coming from the corporate sector, even if they're racially and, and diverse and diverse by gender, that is not a diverse group. Um, I was once in an institution where everyone on the board was corporate and they diversified by adding lawyers. Again, I would say that is not a diverse group. Oh, yeah, right. And so, you know, do you have writers? Do you have artists? Do you have folks from the nonprofit world? So I, I, those are really important questions, but it is invisible work and they have all the power. So that's my next topic for research. And I think that um, I'm on a mission to make that work visible and make them visible. So. Right now we have pressure in higher ed to diversify faculty sure. and the boards are actually putting that pressure on the administration, but no one is putting pressure to diversify boards. Well, this is your, uh, your goal. And My mission in life. <laughs> Carrie is at the Council for Independent Colleges, which is a great group of about a thousand or plus uh, college universities. So that might be uh, a great group to work a with. A good partner, yeah. Uh, we have another video question that's come in. This is just coming thick and fast here. And this is from a uh, former student of mine at Penn, now at Penn State, the awesome Mark Kozitska. So let's bring Mark up on stage. Hello, Mark. I think you're muted. There we go. Hello. Uh, th thank you. Uh, Brian Brown always mentions that too. And and by the way, Ken and I believe uh, I'm from Georgetown as well too. So uh, thank you for, for teaching as well. Um, anyways, uh, one of my big focuses in on, I work at, uh, I work in IT, um, learning and development, and uh, and one of the, one thing that's always been fascinating to me is, you know, is the relationship between higher ed and the labor market. And so one of my questions uh, is, so in the labor market, there are obviously various ceilings that everyone encounters, you know, male, female, et cetera, et cetera, cultural wise, um, mm -hmm. regarding educational background, you know, whether the requirements having a BA, MA, et cetera, et cetera. And this is particularly evident um, in higher education, whether it be regarding, you know, in structure, tenure track, et cetera, et cetera, or administrative, whether it be management per department, per, you know, college, et cetera, et cetera. And as educators, what can we do or what message can we tell, you know, our women students regarding these ceilings that, you know, for these women students that may not want nor particularly have the time or money to, you know, pursue additional qualifications, whether it be another, you know, master's degree, you know, or a PhD, um, where when they're competing for a job that may have, you know, the requirements of a BA or an MA, but, you know, for, for a woman, you know, to kind of even stand out in a crowd of, you know, perhaps men and these applicants that they may need that, you know, kind of bump up of, you know, of, a, of a, you know, of an ed another educational kind of tier or what have you. So what advice could we, you know, could we provide, you know, um, women, you know, that are in that position that may not, again, may not have the time or money to get those qualifications to compete, um, you know, in a, you know, in, in one of these, one of these fields. And also, you know, how could you potentially address that to you know regarding regarding culture maybe you have you know uh, a woman student from you know a uh, 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 Middle Eastern background or something like that so could you speak on that a little bit Thank you. I'm, I'm having Elizabeth Warren uh, flashes sorry <laughs> I mean well, the question is uh, you know basically how do you go about advising a woman that she needs more qualifications than her male competitors? That's what I heard, but maybe I miss her. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I don't mean to, you know, sound, you know, make it sound derogatory or anything like that, but you know, oh, no, so for no. instance, how would, how would you, yeah, how would how you does she stand out? Right. Yeah. How, how, and how can we, you know, potentially address that? So, you know, for instance, from a male perspective to, uh, you know, to, to a female student or something like that, that is, that is seeking that type of advice that again, may not, you know, want to, or, you know, want to pursue, you know, additional educational qualifications for, you know, for whatever reason. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that if um, we're advising them to go above and beyond their competitors, that's one thing. Um, if we're advising them to get the qualifications or, or not, I think 
I would say the same advice for men, right? You know, do you, do you want to go for this master's? Do you want to go for this doctorate? Um, I think that to ask them to kind of go above and beyond their competitors um, in this area, that might not even be effective. Um, I think from what I've seen, the, the best practices for hiring are, are when you're actually, you know, applying for a position at a place that has gotten the training and has diversified their search process and they have those protocols in place. And more and more of us do now, right? Your pool has to be diverse at every stage of the of the search process. And if it's not, it's often a rejected search. So um, if if this person, you know, this kind of potential student is applying for positions where that's not the case or in, a, in an environment where that's not the case, I think it's a challenging situation. Um, and I don't think individuals can change it by themselves, right? So it's kind of, those, those are structural changes that need to happen. I'm mm -hmm. kind of imagining her being in this tech sector that's dominated by men. And if it's that hard to get in and get the job, it's going to be hard for her to be successful, to get promoted, to feel valued. Like that's going to be tough all along. So um, I don't know if I would tell her to get additional credit, credit credentials for that. So appreciate that's that. A depressing you, right? answer, but <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I mean, any, you know, just any, any bit that, you know, yeah. maybe more dialogue that we can have around it. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I mean, not all these questions have, um, have triumphant answers. Um, we do have a uh, comment that came in. We just put this up on stage. Uh, and this is from Mercedes Fisher at Concordia University, who says, I really like these options to help women with these offers. I'm referring to <laughs> I was told by a committee member after I accepted a job and started working, I would have had 12,000 more a year if I had negotiated. Wow. Wow. Um, I will say I have never, ever, ever heard of someone losing a job because they negotiated. But the, I've never heard of a situation where an offer was taken away because they tried to negotiate. So just just think about that. There's there, yeah. there's no there's no cost like that. There's right. no, no right. Cost. And even if they can't, if you can't negotiate your base salary, you can negotiate moving costs. I know someone who negotiated moving costs. If anyone knows the Boston area from uh, Cambridge to Boston. So sometimes the person who's hiring can't give you more money in your base salary, but they have other pools of money available to them where they can give you money. So it never hurts to negotiate, ask for more vacation time, ask for professional development that's that's mm -hmm. hefty, 10,000 a year professional development, just do it. So this is great. <laughs> Wait, that's uh, a heartbreaking story. That's why I'm like, ah, and when someone tells you afterwards that, oh, if you had negotiated, you could have gotten more, um, that's salt in the wound. Did my screen just go black? I froze. Everyone on my screen froze. May may have been at one of our ends, but but either okay. way, we're both back. Let me okay. just bring this back up because this is a great question. I know. Put that back up. <laughs> this is this is a classic deep question. Jessica served at Penn State, who asks, yeah. "Why is it such a hurdle for women to get into STEM? Do they get turned away or discouraged?" I actually think that links to the question that was just asked, not about the negotiating salary, but the prior one of, do you talk folks go into going into fields where it's a hostile environment for women? I, I do think, or, and, or people of color. Um, I, I think there are some brave souls that will go into those spaces mm -hmm. and they are challenging spaces, but yes, I think they're discouraging for, um, you know, STEM can be very discouraging for women. Uh, and I think that we've learned that you need to recruit students or hire faculty in groups. Um, earlier, someone talked to, I think it was, uh, no, I can't remember her name now, um, who was the first hire in chemistry, right? To be the first woman to come into an all-male department, to be the first person of color to come into an all-white department. 
we that is a heavy lift for an individual. Um, and so we have I learned some good lessons in higher ed to hire in clusters, hire women in groups, build mm -hmm. affinity groups on campus so that people have um, spaces to regroup um, and share share their experiences and work with administrators to improve the climate on campus. Um, and in their department. And I think the same thing for people of color. Um, and so uh, breaking into a male dominated uh, department field is really, really challenging. And so um, I would advise people on the market to, to look for departments that have done some cluster hiring or that have some resources in place. So they've acknowledged that this is a challenging space and they're trying to work on that. And in the hiring conversations or the when you're on the search, um, ask pointed questions about this. Um, are there resources for women on campus uh, through the provost's office where um, women in the STEM areas can come together? Um, because it is it, any anything. Uh, faculty work already is very isolating, but to be uh, one of the only women or to be one of the only people of color in a department it makes it even more so. Well, that's really really good advice. We, we are almost out of time, um, and which is remarkable. We've just blasted through an hour, but we have time for one more, a couple, a couple more questions. Let me bring up one from someone who hasn't asked a question yet today. This is from the awesome Roxanne Riskin. Who asks? I noticed that guest writers discussed having a grateful attitude for helping reduce stress. What have you seen as new initiatives? Whoops, sorry, let me put that back up again. <laughs> what have you seen as new initiatives to support mental health and wellness at the University for Women? Uh, so I've seen new initiatives, not just for women, but also um, for people of color and and for different affinity groups, um, but also. I, I've seen some real moves in health and wellness over my time in higher ed um, to really just an awareness that we need support um, and that that work can be really stressful, especially work that involves working with students and helping students. Um, I think as we've seen that we need to put some more supports in place for students on our campuses, we've realized that we also need to do the same thing for staff and faculty. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think, again, the students have pushed us to build affinity groups for students, right, for female students or black students or Latinx students. And they have also helped us create space where we build similar affinity groups for faculty and staff. Um, so I think our, our students, ironically, are our best allies in this situation for making culture change happen quickly on campus. Students have been very effective. Um, so a long answer but use your students effectively <laughs> great that's a great answer and uh thank you for that and thank you roxanne for the great question unfortunately i have to thank us all for the hour because it is done uh we have reached the end um mary thank you so much oh uh, ryan thank you thank everyone for the great questions too it's a fa fabulous conversation this is the forum. People do this. They're, they're, they're terrific. Let, let me ask, where can people keep up with all of your different work? Uh, there's the University of Venus and Inside Higher Ed. Yep, yep. I have a few podcasts, uh, Rocking the Academy with uh, Rupika Rizm, and I have The View from Venus, which is an extension of University of Venus. Um, and then also this kind of episodic podcast, it's called X Ed. It's about experiential ed or experience ed, X Ed. Um, and let's see, Twitter is a great place to find me uh, at Mary underscore Churchill. And LinkedIn, I'm very, you know, you can send me a message on LinkedIn and say, we participated in this conversation together. And then I'll, I consider that my modern day Rolodex, LinkedIn. So um, LinkedIn and Twitter are really good places to find me. Well, that all works. And you all heard it here, friends. These are all the different ways you can keep up with uh, Mary Churchill's terrific work. Uh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm just delighted that you had the time for us. Uh, all best with your new research project. All best well, luck thank with you. Hawkins book. When it comes out, let us know so that we can bring you back to talk. Awesome. About and then we'll talk mergers and closures. Um, always. You know me. I'm happy to discuss that. I'm that kind of person. Uh, again, <laughs> okay. thank you so much, Mary. Uh,